button to make sure you can hear me and uh, see. Uh, th thanks, Zach. Uh, Zach already raised his hand, and I see others raising their hands. So, and you can see um, Rich is great. Thank you, Samantha. Artwork there. So uh, he's saying hello with a smiley face. Uh, and David and Martin, thanks, everybody. So, anyways, uh, welcome to today's uh, uh, webinar. Um, as uh, you've been through most, uh, many of these, uh, some of you, I see a lot of familiar na names out there. Uh, today's uh, presentations, uh, the main uh, presenter will be Rich Medeiros. He'll introduce himself uh, very, very shortly, but uh, he's going to try to teach us how to read a psychometric chart. And uh, God bless him if he can. Uh, <laughs> um, usually puts me to sleep, but I didn't say that. Uh, sorry, I said that. So, anyways, a couple housekeeping things. Uh, it looks like people are hearing us. Um, uh, 24 hours after today, you'll receive an email with uh, access to the uh, recording of today's webinar. They're always available online as well on takeocomfort.com or, or our website. Uh, so if you do go to our website under training, you have access to um, all of the uh, webinars that we've been doing. Our, uh, the commercial team as well as uh, uh, the residential team, John, uh, John uh, Rick, and Dave have been doing quite a few as well. So those are always available if you would like to uh, check in on some of those as well. So, um, and uh, attached to that email will be your uh, access to a PDH certificate if you need that in your in, in your location. So I will be uh, monitoring the questions and uh, bringing them up every once in a while. Rich will pause or I'll uh, interrupt uh, when I can uh, to, to to ask uh, some pertinent questions. So. Uh, and, and please, let's let's make this as interactive as possible. It is it does make a, a big difference uh, for all of us. Uh, this uh, topic here, I think Rich will explain why psychometric charts are so important. I, I know he's uh, he's uh, taught us some things uh, internally uh, on, on on these as well. So, anyways. <laughs> So uh, Bill, Bill's saying, this is dangerous. Once you show a psych chart to the unwashed, their eyes glaze over and you get called by the guy's wife wanting to know what we did to him. So uh, just keep that in mind. Uh, uh, that's what a psychometric chart could do to you, according to uh, our friend Bill. Uh, so God bless all. So uh, without further ado, I am going to turn it over to my good friend, uh, Rich Medeiros. Rich, take it away. Well, thanks, Brett, and welcome, everyone, and thanks for joining our session here on how to read a psychrometric chart. Uh, just a quick intro for myself. I am a mechanical engineer here at TACO. I'm one of the senior systems engineers. I am a PE registered in a couple of different states, and I've been doing this for a few years. Prior to joining TACO, I was actually on the consulting side of the industry, so some of you folks that are sitting out there today uh, may also be uh, working in consulting firms. And through the years, I've, I've done quite a few projects and had to uh, learn the ins and outs of psychrometrics. So today we're going to talk a little bit about how to read a psychrometric chart. And with a little luck, I've got some new, new toys to play with today. I have a uh, graphics pad here. And as you can see, I can draw some really cool things. Um, so we're going to try that out, and hopefully that's going to be successful. So here are some of the things we're going to cover. We're going to be talking about dry bulb temperature, wet bulb temperature, dew point temperature. These sounds like boring topics, like Brett said. Relative humidity. We'll go through uh, the actual psychrometric. Oh, I spelled that incorrectly. Look at that, Brett. You were right. I, I knew I'd spell something incorrectly. <laughs> well, someplace we had to. <laughs> I know it. Uh, let's see. Psychro. I got the R in there. I wonder why it didn't pick that up on the spell check. Well, who knows? Every so often, you run into a problem. Uh, okay, so we're going to, uh, like I said, we'll cover these topics here. Psychrometric, psychrometric, yeah, that's right. Sensible heating, we'll talk about uh, sensible cooling, air mixing. That's always uh, fun. That's good to do on a Saturday night. Cooling and dehumidification, sensible heat ratio, and we'll talk about a little system application. So those are all the wonderful topics we're going to cover today. So hopefully you'll enjoy uh, uh, some of this good stuff, as we say. All right. So uh, let's get into the very, very first thing, and that is uh, uh, wet bulb and dry bulb. So this is uh, something that most familiar, uh, most people have uh, heard the terms before, but what does it really mean? 
Well, I have uh, a wet bulb and dry bulb thermometer. Uh, and over here on the left, we're going we're gonna to pretend, by the way, that this is in uh, degrees Fahrenheit. I'm just going to put an F up here. It really doesn't matter, but today I'm talking about degrees Fahrenheit all the time. So we'll just pretend it is. So this thermometer on the left side that I'm pointing to right now is considered a dry bulb. And that's because the bulb part of the thermometer is dry, just as the name implies. And I'll, in a minute, we'll, we'll go back and forth a couple of times. Then on the right side, there is another thermometer, and this is called the wet bulb thermometer. And if you'll notice, it has a cloth wick surrounding the bulb. And that cloth wick is kept moist by a reservoir of water in this little tiny jar here. So that's water inside the jar. And that water will wick up on this little uh, cloth piece and when air let's say air blows across that thermometer it actually reduces in temperature so you can get the general idea of what's going on here the dry bulb is at one temperature and then when air flows across this cotton wick and causes the moisture to evaporate it actually reduces the temperature on the bulb and this is a lower temperature over here and that's what we call the wet bulb so there are temperatures when we're talking about systems all the time, air systems, we're always talking about uh, wet bulb and dry bulb. And, and that's a quick definition and a little example of what uh, wet bulb and dry bulb. It's actually as simple as that. And by the way, the difference between the dry bulb temperature and the wet bulb temperature is called the wet bulb depression. So I'm just gonna make up a number, not the ones that are shown in this chart here. So if I had a dry bulb temperature of 70 degrees Fahrenheit dry bulb, and then I had a 50 degrees Fahrenheit wet bulb measured at the same moment in time. Oops, that's supposed to be wet bulb. But the good news, Brett, is I have a little eraser here so I can go like this, isn't that cute? I tell you, the tools you have are first class. It's, it's uh, pretty amazing. It's, it's yeah, it's, it's fun stuff. And so the difference between those two would be 20 degrees Fahrenheit, and that's called the wet bulb depression. Uh, now, this instrument, by the way, in this picture is a bit crude in terms of modern uh, uh, instrumentation. Uh, we have uh, electronic devices that can measure the wet bulb and dry bulb very, very accurately. Actually, most temperature and humidity sensors, they measure the dry bulb temperature. Whoops, that looks like two B's right there. How do I say that, two B's in a pod? Um, yeah, let's get rid of that. So uh, most modern instrumentation today measures uh, dry bulb, that's a D, dry bulb, and relative humidity. Why does that D look like an O? Let me try that one more time, dry bulb. <laughs> my, my D's look like O's. Well, anyway. Um, so that's uh, what wet bulb and dry bulb are all are like. It's as simple as that. It's, uh, again, repeating that it winds up being uh, the dry bulb temperature is measured by a thermometer with no moisture evaporating, and the wet bulb temperature is measured by moisture evaporating on the bulb of the thermometer. And by the way, uh, which may be intuitive, but I'll repeat it in, or I'll state it anyway, and that is that the, uh, you know, the wet bulb temperature winds up being a function of the relative humidity. The drier it is out, the lower the wet bulb temperature at the corresponding dry bulb temperature. So Brett, do we have any questions? That's kind of fundamental and it's, it's, uh, it's kind of important in terms of what we're talking about today. There's a basic question. Um, uh, how often did you use uh, psychometrics uh, in your design career? Uh, well, every single air system design requires a psychrometric analysis. So I would say that on an average, I probably use the psychrometric information at least uh, once or twice every week for my wow. entire career. And then sometimes, you know, even more than that, depends on how t intense the program, the project is that you're working on. So uh, Gene says, great pictures, makes sense now. And it's true. It is. It does break it down to to the basics or, or to the simple simplest, you know? <laughs> yeah, and you know, when we start getting into the details of psychrometrics, and psychrometrics, if I hadn't mentioned it, uh, is the study of moist air. And uh, it's, a, it's one of the fundamental uh, ideas about uh, psychrometrics, uh, wet bulb and dry bulb. Okay, so the other one, the other big one that we talk about all the time is called dew point temperature. 
So here I've got uh, a glass of water. Let's assume for a moment that these are ice cubes uh, floating in this water here, but let's start off and pretend. We have to kind of do a lot of pretending in engineering. Let's pretend that the water temperature happens to be room temperature. So initially we've got room temperature, room temperature water. And um, uh, so let's assume that the room temperature is 72 degrees Fahrenheit and the water is at 72 degrees Fahrenheit. And then we drop a couple of ice cubes in it and then we stir it up. So I'm going to kind of stir it up here and I just drop one ice cube in at first, stir it up and stir it up. And uh, the water's starting to get a little colder now. And, and at this point, it's still 72 degrees. And <clears throat> as I add more and more ice, I'm doing this, uh, adding the ice slowly to reduce the water temperature. And as it turns out, in my example here, I'm in a room whose uh, dry bulb temperature is 72 degrees Fahrenheit. You can see it here, my little thing. And the room relative humidity, which is relatively comfortable, is about 45%. If I keep reducing the water temperature till I get the water temperature down to 49.5 degrees Fahrenheit, moisture will begin to condense on the outside of the glass. And that point at which moisture begins to condense is called a dew point temperature. So a lot of people think about the dew point temperature. Maybe they think about it in terms of getting up in the morning uh, and their car is full of water. It hasn't rained overnight, but the car is completely wet. Well, that's because the surface of your car, the actual surface is just below the dew point temperature, which is causes the moisture to condense. So that's what we mean by dew point temperature. So, so far we've talked about wet bulb temperature, dry bulb temperature, and dew point temperature. So hopefully that kind of gets us focused in on what those three values are. And whenever we're talking about air, the room that you're sitting in right now, wherever you might be, those three values are constantly floating around our, uh, in terms of uh, HVAC systems. We think of the air as having, at one moment in time, wherever you're sitting, so you have the dry bulb temperature, which is the temperature you can measure with this uh, conventional therm thermometer. You have the uh, wet bulb temperature, which we showed you how you can measure. You can have the dew point temperature. And as it turns out, you only need two of those values to use a psychometric chart, which we're going to get into next. Um, any questions, Brett, about those three? Which, uh, what is the one that the weather men weather women tell us every morning or it's not a, every yeah, morning it's but the dew point temperature so they'll get up and they'll they do the weather report let's say and they'll say well tomorrow's dew point temperature will be uh in the say mid 60s and that's oppressive in my little example here if you'll notice with 72 degrees dry bulb and 45 percent relative humidity the dew point temperature would be around 49 and a half degrees fahrenheit well that's very comfortable but as the dew point temperature rises, the amount of moisture rises, the relative humidity goes up, and then it becomes un, uh, uncomfortable. And anything over 55 to 60 degrees in that range, it becomes very uncomfortable. Anything over 60 is considered oppressive. So yeah, it has a huge impact. So the weather reports today, they they always report on the dew point temperature. The dew point, by the way, you know, is around 45 to 50 degrees Fahrenheit. It's pretty comfortable out there. So someone, can you clarify how we determine the dew point? I think you said it, but if you could do that again. Yeah, it's the point at which moisture will begin to condense on a surface. So in our example here of this glass, we've added some, um, let's say the, the water temperature inside our glass is initially 72 degrees Fahrenheit, same as the room temperature. And the room that we're in right now is 45% relative humidity. And when you see the psychrometric chart, by the way, this will begin to make a little more sense. Then as we add ice cubes and we stir it up, that water gets colder and colder and colder until the surface of that glass hits 49.5 degrees Fahrenheit. And that's when we start to see moisture condensing. And at that point, that's the dew point temperature. Hopefully that helped with that definition. Yeah. So uh, uh, John, uh, John is uh, looking for a clarification here. Is, do you, don't you technically need three pieces of information because you have to know the atmospheric pressure to know which psych chart to look at? Yeah, that's a good point. And uh, that actually will show up when we uh, go to the psych chart next. Yep. All right, move on, my friend. Okay, so um, now let's take a look at a psych chart. I've got a psych chart here. Um, 
I was able to, I, I have the software, uh, I purchased the software from a company called Hands Down Software. And so here's one of their psychometric charts. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna switch over to my whiteboard. And the reason I'm gonna do that is because uh, I wanna be able to blow up the psych chart um, to a larger size so I can zoom in on a couple of different things here. So um, hopefully you can see my psych chart. That's the same one I just showed you, but only right now it's on my uh, whiteboard. I can, yes. Okay, so um, to John's point, the very first thing we have to make sure of is that the psychometric chart is, um, is at the right atmospheric pressure. So this particular psychometric chart and all the ones we're gonna look at today are considered to be at sea level, which has a barometric pressure of 29 point, uh, let me get rid of that, uh, 29.92 inches of mercury, which is also the same as 14.7 pounds per square inch absolute. So that's the very first thing we need to know is the atmospheric pressure. So all the site charts that we're looking at today, we're going to um, assume that we are at sea level uh, in this particular case. Okay, so we're going to try our eraser here. Look at that. All right, I tell you, this is really cool stuff. All right, so I want to point out uh, some of the things that's in our psychometric chart. So I'm going to try zooming in here a little bit. Don't worry about the fact that we can't see the whole thing because I'll zoom out a little bit later. But I want to talk about the, uh, the different scales on the chart. So the horizontal scale right here, whoops. I didn't mean to move that. Sorry about that. Let's see if we can get this to work now. All right. Put that over there. There we go. Looks okay. Good. So the horizontal scale is called the dry bulb temperature. And if you remember a moment ago, we know how to measure the dry bulb temperature. It's a simple thermometer. And the bulb of the thermometer is just dry. And it's basically just measuring the ambient air that we're sitting in. Uh, so that's along the horizontal axis. Along the vertical axis is called the humidity uh, ratio, and this is in grains per pound of dry air. And uh, one of the interesting things about uh, the grains of moisture is that there are 7,000, this is a great number here, 7,000 grains uh, <laughs> per pound uh, of dry air. So there are 7,000 grains per pound. That's kind of cool, huh? So yeah. grains are a very, very small number um, for us to use for measurement. Okay, these numbers over here on the slanted part of the chart, these are uh, be considered wet bulb temperatures. So there's that wet bulb, we're starting to introduce that. And then, like I said before, if we know any two points on the psychometric chart, we can find the other points. But let me just point out what some of the other lines here mean. So uh, let's go over here and we'll see that uh, this line, these curved lines here, see these curved lines right here? These are lines of constant relative humidity. So I just circled the 50% relative humidity line. There's 40%, 30 and so on. There's 60%. And those are all the different values for relative humidity. So we can easily see the relative humidity on this chart. There's another value over here. Oops, well, I'll erase here while I'm chatting. Um, there's another value over here called the specific volume. And in this case, I'll circle this. This diagonal line represents the specific volume of air. And that happens to be 14 cubic feet per pound of dry air. This line over here is 13. They didn't label this one in the middle. This is 13.5. And in some of our calculations, we tend to use the 13.5 as the average specific volume. Okay, so then we also have, let's see if we can erase this stuff. Over here on the right, we also have a dew point temperature. So let's try to drag this chart over. And we can see that we have the dew point temperature, that's this scale here on the left of this black line. I kind of draw it this way first. So these are the dew point temperatures. And if you'll notice, it starts down here at zero, it goes 10, 20, 25, 30, all the way on up. It just keeps increasing as we go in this direction here. The, the 
The other values on the right side of dew point temperature are the vapor pressure, and that's the partial pressure of the vapor that's in the air. I'm not going to talk about uh, vapor pressure because when we do psychometric calculations, we generally don't get involved with vapor pressure. Uh, it's not that big of a deal. Okay, a couple of other values to look at here. Let's try erasing some of this stuff. Now, uh, the other thing we have is called enthalpy. Now, enthalpy is uh, the amount of the total energy of the air. Maybe so often, yeah. Okay, so here's the enthalpy, and that's what these black uh, letters, uh, numbers rather, represent. And one of the interesting things about most psychometric charts actually work this way. If you'll notice, um, let's just pick the number 20. This is uh, 20 BTUs per pound. That line is the 20 BTUs per pound of dry air line. And then if I go all the way down, whoops, let's see if I can measure, move this over here. Yeah. So if I go all the way down to uh, this value over here, this is, if you'll notice, this is also enthalpy. Down here, it's, it's labeled over here as enthalpy on the right. So this scale is, there's 20 there, and there's 20 there. And if I draw a straight line, um, you can't see this on the screen, but I have a triangle, plastic triangle here. I'm going to try drawing a straight line, overlaying it over that black line. And hopefully this works. Did that work, yep. Brad? Yes, Pretty it good. did. So um, it's really uh, this other scale of enthalpy around here. That's really to allow you as the, person uses a psychometric chart to be able to line up the values. So if you know that you have some point over here, let me just make a point on the graph here, and I want to find out what the enthalpy is, well, I have to line up, in this case, it looks like it's close to 27 up there, 25, 26, 27 down here. So that might be, yeah, that would, 27, that would go through those two points, and that means that would go through my point right here. So it's just a, a way of lining up the straight line so you can get a more accurate number for enthalpy. So uh, those are the different values that you see on a psychometric chart. So how can we make use of this uh, wonderful information? Uh, be before you go into that, there's a couple grain statements slash questions. Yes. Uh, so Nicholas is saying, I've always heard that a grain is a drop of water. Is that right? I wonder what size of drop. Yeah, you know, that's a great question. I don't really know the physical size of a grain. All I know is that there are 7,000 grains per pound. So how much is a pound of water? Well, it turns out that, uh, let's see, there's approximately eight and one-third pounds per gallon. So kind of use a rough number. Let's, let's say that um, a pound of water is about an eighth of a gallon. So if I take that... Uh, eighth of a gallon divided into 7,000 parts. Maybe, maybe it is the size of a drop. It could be. Yeah. That's a great, we'll have to do a little research on that, Brett. Yeah, we'll, we'll do some drop research uh, we'll later, some later drop today. Research. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and Eric, J Eric is confirming, isn't it 7,000 grains is equivalent to one pound of water? Uh, just That's like correct. you just said. Correct. Yep. Okay. So now we've got some uh, names of things. We know what the different values are. So Let's try uh, plotting something on here just to find out. Now, remember, uh, again, we're talking about sea level here. So our chart is at sea level. Once we determine that, we pick any two points on this chart. And again, I'm going to blow it up here in a second so you can kind of see what's going on. Um, any two points in this chart will tell us all of the other points that we need to know. So I'm just going to kind of zoom in here a little bit. and I'm going to draw a straight line at roughly, well, hopefully, uh, please keep in mind that I'm drawing these lines on a uh, computer graph here. So it's not as necessarily as accurate as if you're drawing it on a piece of paper. But anyway, I will draw a line here. Try it one more time, Rich. And let's say I'm going to draw it roughly at seven. This looks like 72 right here, so I'm going to see how that works out. No, of course it doesn't want to write. I want to try it again. Alrighty. Aha, I see it uh -huh. now. 70 degrees Fahrenheit. 
Well, let's assume that that's 70 degrees Fahrenheit. And the example we had earlier, I think was around 45% relative humidity. So this is 40% over here, this is 50%. So I wanna be roughly halfway between those two. So I'm gonna draw a line there and say that, oh, that's not the best halfway point, is it? Let's little try low. That one more time. Uh -oh. a, little bit, a little bit low. So we'll draw it again. There, how's that look? Much better. Much better. And then I erased, inadvertently erased my 72 degree line here. Let's try drawing another 72 degree line. Let's see how that comes out. That's pretty close. Not bad. So where those two lines intersect is right here. And if we remember what we said the uh, wet bulb temperature was, um, well, let's say the dew point temperature. We tr if we try moving over here to the right, whoops, it doesn't move uh -oh. with the chart. Whoa, look at that, Brett. Who knew, who knew that was going to happen? We're learning now, baby. We're learning now the hard way. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I guess. It's always a challenge. It's tough okay. to sh show everything. The charts are just so big. Yeah, I know. All right. So let's try uh, Let's try one other quickie thing here. I'm going to try moving this. No, it just doesn't want to move. Doesn't stay with it, huh? It doesn't, uh, you know, when I did this practice earlier for the last uh, week, everything moved correctly. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> it's never it's never that easy. All right. So uh, we, we're going to kind of estimate those two values. We said that 45% relative humidity, 72 degrees Fahrenheit was roughly, roughly over here, roughly here. Okay. I draw a little circle there. Now, if I draw a line that's horizontal, uh, that's to the right, let's see where it intersects the uh, the dew point temperature line here. Let's see what we got here. That's pretty close. It's not super close, but there's 45, 46, 47, 48. And I think our count we said is around 49.5. So my, my line uh, accuracy is not the best in the world. I can see my line is a little bit tilted down. So. Let me try erasing that line one more time. It looked pretty good. One to more me. shot, Brett. Looked you pretty know, good. It, it did look pretty good, didn't it? It's probably a little better if I do it. Too much way. of a perfectionist. Well, you know, we try to be as accurate as possible here. There we go. That's right. We're engineers, so we should engineers. be. Engineers, yeah. So there we go. So you can see that's pretty close to 49.5 degrees Fahrenheit. So again, it was roughly 72 degrees down here, 45% relative humidity. And if we draw a line horizontally on the psychometric chart, we can find the dew point temperature. So that's dew point. Dew point temperature is about 49 and a half degrees. And since we're at that point, we can also find the enthalpy. So if I draw a line that is diagonal over here, we can see that the, whew, that looks nice like 25.5. So there's my, nice enthalpy, sometimes abbreviated as H. My H is equal to 25 point, whoops, 25. Well, there's another uh, little goofy thing. 25.5 degree, uh, that's BTUs per pound, per pound LV, per pound of dry air. Okay, and uh, if we wanted to find out, you can see that here is the specific volume is 13 over here. We said before is 14 over there. This line is 13.5. So it's just above the 13.5. So maybe the specific volume is uh, closer to 13.6 around that, that range. So you can see it given any two points and usually the easiest ones to measure especially with electronic instrumentation, is the dry bulb temperature and the relative humidity. If you have those two values, you can plug them into the psychometric chart. You can find all the other values you want. You can find the enthalpy over here. You can find the dew point temperature. You can find the grains of moisture. Now you can find the specific volume. And all of these are kind of important when you start getting into calculations and fun stuff. So before I go on to some specific examples, Brett, do we have any questions out there? Nope, uh, the, the glassy glazed over look is uh, uh, taking effect. <laughs> Everybody's <laughs> falling asleep already? <laughs> no questions, no it's questions. No. Uh, I, I do remember um, in a couple of uh, presentations uh, other folks have given in uh, maybe previous careers of mine, sometimes you actually will see kind of a, a, a box on this chart of where us humans think it's comfortable. 
if you yeah, know what I mean. Yeah, that's a good point. Uh, there is a gentleman who published a, uh, did some research, uh, and actually did it many years ago, and it, has, it hasn't uh, changed much. And, and what they basically are saying is that the comfort zone, let's say, uh, and I'm just going to kind of, it's not the exact one that the guy published, but it's roughly in that range. So I'm going to say it's between 60 degrees Fahrenheit, 65 and 75. And uh, and then let's just draw a vertical line. This is a rough line here. There's 65 and there's 75 between, whoops, well, that, was, that was different. Yeah, what the heck was that? That was a good one. Was, I don't know was, what it was, but that was awesome. That was really cool. That was the oval uh, draw. The oval draw, <laughs> yeah. So there's 65 and 70, and the relative humidity, we are most comfortable between roughly 55% and 45% kind of create. And so that means in this general area over here is where most people are comfortable. Now, you know, you know from your own experience that if you're inside of a room, it doesn't matter what the temperature, let's say the actual temperature in the room is again, similar to what we said earlier, 72 degrees Fahrenheit and 45% relative humidity. What this guy is saying is that the majority of the people in that room would feel comfortable, but some people would find it a little too warm and other people would find it a little bit too cool. But in this general box here is where the, is where the comfort zone usually lies. Does that help a little bit? Yep, yep. sure does. Okay. We actually, we actually have a question. I think you're going to answer this uh, uh, in your presentation. And this question is from John B. If you can uh, read between the lines of who I'm talking about here. How do we use the enthalpy number? Ah, we can it? use the enthalpy to determine how much energy is required by the system. And I actually have a, a sample problem to show in a couple of minutes. 10-4. Okay. So we're going to uh, leave our whiteboard for a moment and go back to our PowerPoint presentation. And we're going to look at a couple of uh, very simple processes. So one of the most common uh, processes is uh, sensible heating. This is really quite simple. Sensible heating. And we're going to heat this air from a temperature of 40 degrees uh, dry bulb uh, to 70 degrees dry bulb at the same dew point temperature. And that means we're not going to add or take away any moisture from the air. And that's called sensible heating. That's the simplest process that you can plot out on a psychrometric chart. So we're going to take and plot this value out on our psychrometric chart. And again, bear with me, these lines aren't the most accurate in the world, but you can get the general idea of what we're talking about here. So we just said we wanted to go from 40 to 70, so we're at 35 degree dew point temperature. So I'm going to go over here to the dew point temperature line, and which is roughly 35 degrees, and I'm just going to say I'm going to go from 40 degrees Fahrenheit, which is roughly here. What did we say, Brett, 70 degrees Fahrenheit? You did. So I'm going to start over here and draw a line. Oops. Try this again. And then the show. There it is. So th that's called sensible heating. I'm heating the air up from 40 degrees Fahrenheit to 70, and I'm moving from left to right on the psychrometric chart. So whenever I draw a horizontal line from left to right, that's called sensible heating, and I can plot that out on a psychrometric chart. And, and right now we said it was 40 degrees Fahrenheit dry bulb, and I think uh, 35 degrees Fahrenheit dew point. So whenever the dew point temperature remains constant, that's sensible heat. I'm not adding or removing any moisture from the air. Pretty cool stuff, huh? Yep. I, I can see why that's uh, the easy one. <laughs> that's the easiest one that we have. The next one is actually just as easy. It's called sensible cooling. Uh-oh. I case, think we're going the other uh, way. <laughs> now we're going the other way. <clears throat> so in sensible cooling, Again, we're starting off with 110 degrees uh, Fahrenheit dry bulb. We're cooling the air down to 55 degrees Fahrenheit dry bulb at a constant dew point temperature once again. Constant dew point temperature. So if you can try to remember these numbers, Brett, so I don't screw them up. So I'm going to no, go over here to my psych chart. I'm going to start with, uh, I think we said about 110 degrees. So here's 110. 10 right there, it's roughly right here. Yeah, there it is right there. 
Yeah, and 50, I said, I yeah. pull that down to, what did I say my number was? I'll go 50, back. 55, 55. 55, okay. So yeah. then I go down here to 55, which is roughly here. And if I draw a straight line between those two points, I'm going that from is right straight. To straight as an arrow. Left. Right to left this time. And that's sensible cooling. So that's the second process that we can plot on a psychometric chart. Isn't that cool? Yes, it is. And I, I said that. I said that. Isn't that cool? Like implying it's <laughs> it's cool. You know, the only thing that would have been cooler is if you had to use blue instead of red. But that's okay. We'll let you get can away I, with Can I use stuff. blue? I don't even know if I have blue. Do no, I have? Oh, maybe not. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. I do, Brett. I, I could have done. <laughs> this won't be the, the right number, but you can see. There you go. Not, a little too high, but there's the blue line that you asked for. I can. It's like that blue. HSS software that Takeo uh, uh, offers to the industry, right? Yeah. Blue for cooling and red for heating. Makes sense. Blue for cooling and red for heating. Yeah. You know, I always tell people I'm a I'm a simple person, and that's that makes it simple. <laughs> We're in the simple. That. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, all right. So we've gone through uh, a couple of very very simple processes. One's called sensible heating. And the sensible heating is a horizontal line. Let's go back here, just a quick review. Is a horizontal line that goes from a lower temperature to a higher temperature, constant uh, dew point temperature. And sensible cooling is just the opposite. It goes from right to left at a constant dew point temperature. So those are the two most common uh, forms of processes that we can plot on a psychometric chart. Okay. So let's do the next one. The next one is cooling and dehumidification. Now it gets oh, a little bit more complex. Man, man, man isn't that isn't that cool? That big word, that's scary, dehumidification. But so we're gonna cold start cold. off, and these these are fairly common numbers in our industry. I'll I'll just kind of highlight this, make sure I'm using red again. Am I using red? Yeah, yeah, using red. So we have air, and if you'll notice the air, this is, let's say this is outside air, OA, outside air, and the temperature is 95 degrees Fahrenheit dry bulb, 78 degrees Fahrenheit wet bulb. And I looked up the dew point temperature on my psychometric chart prior to this little presentation. And this, the uh, uh, dew point temperature came out to be 71.8 degrees. Now I'm gonna cool that air down to 42 degrees uh, Fahrenheit dry bulb, and about 41 degrees Fahrenheit wet bulb. Now, one of the weird things that happens in a cooling coil, so this little diagram here represents a cooling coil. Whoops. Boy, it, it, uh, it just doesn't want to cooperate today. Cooling, let's try this again. Cooling coil. There we go. So one of the characteristics of a cooling coil is that if you're shooting for, let's say in this case, a 42 degree Fahrenheit, um, the wet bulb temperature will get fairly close to the dry bulb temperature that you're trying to achieve, but for most, for practical purposes, it can never get there. Uh, that's because some of the air passes through the cooling coil unchanged, and we call that bypass air. And uh, you know, the, any coil, no matter how many rows you have in it, there's a certain number of molecules of air that slip through there unaffected. So uh, we can never get the wet bulb temperature to equal the dry bulb off of a cooling coil. It, let's say in terms of most practical applications. Um, you know, I suppose if you put in a, a thousand rows of coil, you could probably get pretty close to uh, the two numbers equaling each other. But nobody's going to ever build a coil with a thousand rows in it. They're probably in the range for cooling, probably in the range of eight to ten rows of, of uh, in the cooling coil. You know so anyway, what? There's there's probably someone on this uh, webinar that's already doing it, baby. A thousand roll coil. <laughs> <laughs> don't, don't don't go out and get a thousand roll coil, please. And, and so you can see that the dew point temperature is going to drop. And if we plot that out, rather than trying to plot it out um, uh, this time, I, I've actually uh, plotted it out previously, so we have a nice picture. You pre -plot and so there's it. our entering the cooling coil, which we said was 95 and 78. That's 95 degrees. Um, uh, dry bulb, 78 degrees wet bulb, and then we're going to cool it down to, I think we said 42 degrees uh, dry bulb and 41 degrees One. wet bulb. Does that sound right? Yeah. Yep. 42, are... 41. And so one of the things, uh, characteristics that happens when air passes through um, a cooling coil, initially, if you notice, the line is horizontal. 
I'm going to actually change color so you can see it a little bit better here. Let me just erase that, and then I'm going to try a different color here. Let's try this. If you notice, the, initially, uh, the the air starts to do, it's a horizontal line, so it does some sensible cooling, but then the air begins to hit the, the coil and the surface temperature of the coil is below the dew point and starts to condense moisture out. And so then it follows this line all the way down until it gets down here where the leaving coil temperature is. So what has happened is that not only has the air been cooled, but because we're dropping vertically in this direction here, kind moisture of out. vertically in that direction, that means that we're taking moisture out of the air. And if you'll notice, and I've kind of extended over here to the right. I think we said, well, let's just go back and see what we said. The dew point temperature was about 72, and now it's down to around 40. So that means it was over here about this value of 72, and now it's down at 40, way down here. So we squeeze the moisture out of the air, and all we have to do is pass the air over a cooling coil, and the temperature of the coil, whether it's being um, driven by hydronics where water is inside the tubes or if it's uh, refrigerant, the temperature of the surface area of the coil is cold enough to force the moisture to condense out. By the way, when we do that, it does in fact uh, generate condensate and we can calculate the amount of condensation that we have coming out of our system by knowing a few values here. So if we look at, now this is what, uh, what John was getting at in terms of the enthalpy. I'm just going to roughly, roughly estimate where the enthalpy is. I have it more accurately in the next slide, but I'm going to kind of estimate what it is here. I think it's going to be around 40, what is that, about 42, uh, maybe 41, uh, 41 and a half. That looks pretty good. There's 40, 41 and a half. Yeah, th there you're, it is. That's pretty you're, good. You're talking at the entering coil. Yep. And then it's going to leave here. And, then, and again, this is just an estimate. I have a more accurate number in a moment. So it's going to leave there at around uh, almost 16. So down here, uh, let's say that uh, uh, H, H is the abbreviation for enthalpy. And it's a pro I'm going to use the word approximate. Uh, that looks like it's about 42. That's BTUs per pound, dry air. And then let's call that H1, and then H2 down here is about, about 16, 16 BTUs per pound. Now, how much work did the coil do? Well, this is what I think John was getting at earlier. So the amount of work that the coil does is equal to the BTUs per hour the BTUs per hour is equal to 4.5, and that's a constant, CFM uh, delta H. There's the delta H. So uh, let's assume that our system was using a very, very simple, let's say it was using uh, 1,000 CFM, Brett? Yep. 1,000 like, CFM. We like round numbers. We like doing things with round numbers. So the BTUs per hour is equal to 4.5 times a thousand times the difference in enthalpy. So that would be H1 uh, uh -oh. minus H2, which we just 26, said. 26, 36, 26. 26 minus 16 is equal to? No, 42 minus 16 equals 26. 26. So I'll put that in there, 26. And if I did my calculation, and that would be, let's see how, how accurate I am. I, I have a calculator in front of me. So it's a thousand <laughs> times it's 26 your phone. times 4.5, and that means 117 BTUs per hour is equal to 117,000 BTUs per hour. Okay, and if I divide that by 12,000, take that and divide it by 12,000, I can turn that into tons. So divided by 12,000, that's equal to 9.7 five tons cooling. Isn't that cool? Yeah. All that from those two numbers. Bingo, bingo, All that bingo. from those two numbers. Let's see. I think I already, and I, I, I actually plotted that out. There it is right there. So um, only this time I did it for 10,000, which should be roughly 10 times that amount. 
And if you'll notice, I did this calculation based on 10,000 CFM. Here's my entering air, 95 degrees and 78, 95 dry bulb, 78 wet bulb. Here's my dew point temperature, 71.8. And what did I estimate the dew point temperature? About 72, I think. Yep. Go back here. Yeah. Yeah, about 72. Now remember yep. the, the chart is gross, but the calculation is much more accurate. And then the final condition, again, 10,000 CFM, 42 degrees dry bulb, 41 degrees wet bulb. Here is my enthalpy around, four, we said it was, I looked it up, we said on our chart, what was that, about 42? You yeah, said, 42, yep, the actual 42 is about and 16. Yep. 41.396. And then the enthalpy at the discharge, I think we said was 16, the actual is closer to 15.691. It does the calculation, exactly the same calculation, only this time I'm using 10,000 instead of 1,000, instead of somewhere around, what did I just estimate it over here, about 9.7 uh, tons. It's around uh, 97 tons, or 96.4 tons right there. So that's how you, uh, that's how you do those calculations. Isn't, isn't that the coolest thing you ever saw? So obviously this is a um, uh, hands-down software that allows you to do this relatively straightforward, it looks like. Yeah, I'm actually gonna show everyone a, a, an example using the software. Um, again, it's not software that we sell or provide, but I think you can get the software, there's a free version, and you can get it through one of your AirSide. Uh, so call, uh, check with your Takeo rep, whatever AirSide product that they provide, that usually the, it's similar to the our software, Brett, in the sense that you can get our software from us, that the right. HSS software, yep. you get the, kind of the introductory version, you get it free from us. You can get it from other suppliers, but the hands-down software is similar. You can get it from a variety of different sources. So check with your rep, and chances are he can get you a free copy of this in, uh, of the standard version. I have the professional version, uh, which I bought several years ago, so it's it's a little bit more has a few more capabilities, but it, but it'll do all the same basic calculations. So, so so Cameron's asking, why did you divide by 12? Actually, 12,000 to get the tons, correct? Oh yeah, way back here, I I just because the original value is 117,000 BTUs per hour, and I divided that by 12. I should have written it over here somewhere. Well, let me put it up in the right hand corner, left hand corner. So it's 12,000 or left corner. 12,000 BTUs per ton hour. And that's the conversion between BTUs per hour and tons per ton hour. Hopefully that answered that question. Yep, I'm sure it did. And uh, uh, you, you was saying that uh, uh, he believes that in this software, there's actually, a, uh, gives you a comfort envelope as well. So uh, that may be available in this software when you uh, get, uh, try using it. Yeah, this is, this is a pretty, uh, uh, there are a variety of uh, uh, psychrometric uh, software applications out there. Th this happens to be the one that I'm familiar with, but um, I'm sure there are others out there that you can experiment with and decide which one yep. you want to use. Yep. Okay, let's see how we're doing for time. We're doing pretty good. Yep. Okay, uh, so uh, here is another uh, thing that you can do on a psychrometric chart. It's called mixing. And again, uh, this is a very, very simple example. But uh, one of the uh, key things about mixing is that you have to know the out. So I'm going to do, let's, not the output. I'm just going to um, uh, do a little mixing of outside air and return air. And this is probably fairly common, fairly common calculation. Uh, so I have an air handling unit or part of an air handling unit. Let's say not the entire air handling unit, but I have a section of the air handling unit here. And I have outside air that I'm delivering at 200 CFM, and I have return air, return air, air. Well, look at that, Brett. That was, <laughs> so I, 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 let's see. Let's see if I can just m make this, oh no, I can't because I copied it from, uh, well, that was a mistake, wasn't it? You always see these things when you're in presentation mode. When you do the review a million times, you never see it. Okay, so there's your return air. So I have outside air, 95 degrees dry bulb and 75 degrees dry bulb over here. Now it will be important uh, in terms of the wet bulb and the, uh, for the wet bulb, but in terms of the initial calculation, I'm only interested in 
finding out what the mix air temperature would be. So that would be mix air over here when those two air streams mix air. And I'm only interested initially in the dry bulb temperature, the dry bulb. And the equation is down here. The mix air dry bulb is equal to the outside air dry bulb times the outside air CFM. So that's 95 and 200. I'll get to that in a minute. Plus the return air dry bulb times the return air CFM, that entire part divided by the total CFM. So I've substituted the numbers. There's the 95 uh, dry bulb outside, the 200 CFM of outside air, the 75 degree dry bulb, the 800 CFM of return air and divide that whole thing by the total airflow, which is 1,000 CFM. I did the calculation out here, that's 19,000, 16,000 divided by plus 19,000 plus 16,000. That uh, sum divided by 1,000. So that's 79,000 divided by 1,000. So the mixed air temperature is gonna come out to 79 degrees dry bulb. There was a mouthful for you. That was mixing. And that's mixing. And all mix air calculations are done in a similar fashion. When we plot it on a psychometric chart, it looks like this. The outside air is right here. The return air is right here. And if I connect those two points with a straight line, and then I take the new mix air dry bulb temperature, which we said was 79 down here somewhere, and I draw a vertical line that will intersect this diagonal line at the mix air point. So I only had to manually, or well, depending on what kind of software you have, but I just manually calculated the mix air temperature and then I plotted it uh, on the psychometric chart. And whenever I uh, have the outside air pointed out here, the return air, all I had to do was now with the mix air temperature, which we just said was about 79 degrees, I just draw a vertical line from that mix air and where it intersects that diagonal line, that's the characteristics of my mix air. So mix air calculations are very important because in all HVAC systems, you always have some part of the system where you're mixing uh, two streams of air. Any questions? Uh, uh, Rick uh, W says, thank God for sensors and BAS. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, true. Yeah. so true. Yeah. So true. But you know, when you're designing a system initially, uh, you really need to do the psychometric analysis uh, so you can decide, you know, where your sensors and everything are going to go. If you don't pick the right equipment, it doesn't matter what you have for sensors. It's not going to work. So, so David says, how does the sensible heat ratio, SHR, affect the design? Uh, the sensible heat ratio comes into effect when it is in the room itself, which we're going to talk about in a minute. Okay. Okay. So here we have a more detailed uh, system application. So we're using some of the characteristics that we had before. Now we have a more detailed air handling unit here. So let's label this air handling unit. And it has, let's say it has an outside air louver. There's our outside air source and it has a return air damper. And then uh, the return air, we said 75 and 45% relative humidity. The outside air is uh, 95 dry bulb, 78 wet bulb, and they're going to mix. And that mix calculation is the one we just showed you. And then once that mix air goes through the cooling coil, we're going to get a set of conditions over here, which we have, uh, I believe we wanted a discharge, what was it before, Brett, 42 degrees Fahrenheit dry bulb and yep. 41 degrees Fahrenheit wet bulb. Okay. Uh, the other thing that we wanted to do was that we want to reheat the air, and I didn't put any numbers prior to this, but I'm just going to reheat my air. So that means that my dew point temperature is going to remain the same from the entering the reheat coil to leaving the reheat coil, because that's sensible heating. So this cooling coil is cooling and dehumidification. Dehumid, I'll put DH for like cooling it. and dehumidification. And CDH. this is... Uh, Say again? I, I said I like it, CDH. CDH, yeah. Cooling and dehumidification. I can put an and here. Uh, and then the reheat is uh, sensible heating. And I'm going to reheat that air up to approximately 60 degrees Fahrenheit. 
And then I'm going to hit, this represents a duct over here. So that represents the room supply air. So my room supply air is going to be a 60 degrees Fahrenheit dry bulb. And I'm going to show you in a psychometric chart what that actual uh, temperature and wet bulb temperature relative humidity is going to be. Then it's going to pick up the room load. And the room is set at 75 degrees uh, dry bulb, 45% relative humidity. That is actually going to be the set point. So whatever my temperature and humidity set point is over here, that's going to be the same conditions as the return air. Some of that air will be exhausted, and then some of it will be returned. So there's the whole cycle in terms of a basic system application. I, I think it's I think it's really um, uh, I'm going to say impressive, but uh, the way you're laying it out makes it to me easy to understand. You, you know what I mean? It's it just kind of you, you just got to follow the numbers and follow it right across. <laughs> yeah, and then this is what it looks like on a psychometric chart. Here is over here. Uh, hopefully you can see this is large enough. Yep. This yep. is the uh, room air or return air. It's the same as the room air. There's the outside air. I'm circling the outside air. I, I should probably change colors again, so it'll be a little bit easier for everyone to see. Let me try this one more time, Brett. Let's try changing it to blue. Okay, so here's the room air, and that's mixing with the outside air, and that mix air temperature, I've abbreviated mix air, was over here. And then it passes through the coil from the mix air, it enters the cooling coil, and it gets all the way down here to this value over here. And then we do a little amount of reheat, because I want to reheat that air up to 60 degrees. And then uh, the room, the, entering the room is this value right here right over here and the slope of this line and that's what someone asked for a moment ago what's the sensible heat ratio for the room that's this line right here that shows you the slope and the, the simplest way well i'm going to kind of be gross brett but hang in there with me um we have this little imaginary triangle that's over here and that imaginary triangle has these two legs to it and it has it looks not good. bad i mean it's almost a 90 degree yeah so uh this is the sensible heat this horizontal line is a sensible heat uh this is the latent heat and this uh, diagonal line is the total heat so the sensible heat ratio is equal to the sensible heat divided by uh the total heat and in this particular case, I'm going to show you in a minute what that value looks like. So if we look at in, this is chart form. Let's look at it in terms of a tabulated form. Oops. What happened to my tabulated form? Oh, no. Uh, bear with me. It looks like I need to retrieve that. Hold on one second, because I did actually do that calculation for everyone in the tabulated form. Hang in there, Brett. Don't yep. get discouraged. I'm not leaving. Uh, let's see. We're getting close to, uh, it's 12.58 though. Yeah, no, we're, we're still in good shape. So we wanted the cooling process and I wanted it in the report format. Here it is here. Ta-da, there it is. Yeah. And so if you'll notice, uh, these are all the points that we just plotted. There's the outside air, 95 and 78. There's the return air, 75 and 45% relative humidity. I'm gonna kind of highlight these things here so we don't lose track of them. Uh, oh no, we can't write on this. But anyway, um, can we write on this? We can't, I can't, I can't write on this. Well, I'll use, can you see my cursor, Brett? Yep, okay. I see your hand. I see my hand. Okay, so uh, there's the outside condition, there's the return air condition, and then there's the mix air. The 75 degree dry bulb, when those two quantities mix at 200 CFM and 800 CFM, uh, the mix air temperature is down here, 79 degrees. We calculated that earlier. And then it goes through the cooling coil, enters the cooling coil at uh, 75 degrees, oh, 79, I'm sorry, 79 degrees dry bulb and 65.015 wet bulb. 
enters the cooling coil and leaves the cooling coil at 50 degrees dry bulb and 48 degrees wet bulb. A little different set of conditions, but you can get the general idea. And then this represents down here the room air conditioning. And if you notice, the sensible heat ratio is over here is point, approximately 0 0.666 or approximately 0 0.67. Uh, so, and again, that 0 0.67 is the ratio of the um, uh, sensible heat divided by the total heat in our little psychrometric analysis. So, so um, a couple of, and then here are a couple of quick references. Um, there is, you can get an app for your phone. Uh, there are multiple apps out there. The one I like to use is, there's one from Munters called the Psychro app. If you just simply go to your uh, app store and you just type in Munters Psychro app, it'll pop up and you can download it for free. It's a nice little app and you can use it. Here's that uh, state point we talked about, the 72 degrees Fahrenheit, 45% relative humidity. You can actually change these labels. Right now, I just have dew point, wet bulb, relative humidity, and uh, enthalpy, 25.51. Another source uh, which is downloadable for free uh, is, uh, happens to be published by the same company, Munters. It's the Dehumidification Handbook. And if you take a picture of the screen, I'm going to leave it up here for a second while we're chatting. Uh, take a picture of this link, you can download the uh, PDF of the manual. I actually have one. Believe it or not, uh, Brett, Mayan is dated 1990. <laughs> Imagine that, 30 and, years. Uh, and Mayan's uh, first edition, and this one is the third edition. So, uh, yeah, and it's pretty cool because, like I said, it's got a lot of examples in there. It's got a psychrometric chart. It's got all kinds of really cool stuff, reference material. Everything you ever wanted to know about psychrometrics um, is in there. Okay, uh, and then this is a link for the hands-down software. I'm not uh, trying to sell it or anything, but uh, I believe you can get a free version of it. There are other uh, uh, software, psychrometric software applications out there. This just happens to be the one I use. They've been around a very long time. Anything that I started using when I uh, has to have been around a long time, right, Brett? Yeah, a <laughs> couple years anyways. A couple years. Uh, so whether you take a picture of this screen or you wait for the recording to come up, you, you can get uh, this kind of information. So how do we do? Look at that. Pretty close to being on time. Awesome. Any questions out there? Yeah, but we, we had a few questions. Uh, we, we'll probably, uh, since it's already after one, um, we might uh, uh, answer them uh, offline. Uh, uh, so, so someone said, John says, uh, you used 1,000 CFM in the example. What would happen if you bumped it up to 12,000 CFM as in an oversized coil? So would that, would that, um, that make sense? Um, I, I'm not sure where the question yeah. is coming from. Yeah, is, it, no, yeah. is it an oversized question or is it just saying, well, what, what would the values be at a higher airflow? Yeah. It turns out yeah. the, the, all the values are linear. So if you double the airflow, you double the... Uh, capacity of the coil or if you're doubling the room load you're, you're doubling I mean if you double the airflow for the room load you're doubling the uh, capacity for the the uh, sp the space itself so we still got a, a quite a good sized crowd here so uh, David said might you explain again how you got the sensible and latent heat from the previous example yeah uh, let me go back here let's go back over here Okay, so um, we're talking about the room conditions here. Um, let me see, I, I, can, I can't blow it up. Well, maybe I can blow it up. Let's try this, Brett. Let's try. Oh, you blew it up. Uh, let's see, can I make this bigger? I think I can. Yeah, yeah. look at that. Ah. Uh, let's zoom out just a hair, okay. So, uh, so typically when we calculate, I, I hope I'm answering the, uh, I'm, I'm answering a question. I'm not necessarily yeah. answering the question that was asked, but hopefully we can fumble through this a little bit. The uh, When you do the room calculation for sensible and latent, that comes out of your cooling load calculation. And uh, when you uh, come up with those two values, if you're using a, a software, the software will always give you the, for a particular room, 
will give you the uh, sensible heat value. It'll give you the latent heat value. If you add those two together, they're the total. So they give you the latent, the sensible, and the total in the software. And then they also will calculate the sensible heat ratio, which again is the, um, and now I can kind of, let's see, I think I can do this. I can, look at this bit. I'm gonna change the color here to, to blue. Um, so this uh, line here, if I draw a horizontal line here and a vertical line here, this horizontal line is the sensible heat and the diagonal line is the total heat, TH, total heat. And the sensible heat ratio, sensible heat ratio is equal to uh, the sensible heat divided by the total heat. And in this particular example, that came out to be approximately 0.67. Or another way of thinking of it is it's 67%, 67% sensible heat, and 23%, can I do that calculation, 10, no, uh, 33, 33%. Um, did I do that correctly? Sensible, no, I'm sorry. I apologize, didn't mean to do that. Yeah, 67% sensible heat. Did that answer the question? I think so. What else we got? We got one or two others out there? Some people- No, we're, we're, we're pretty good. I, I think the other ones we can answer um, um, uh, tomorrow <laughs> with, direct, uh, with direct stuff. Well, good. Bill says, be careful with reheat. It is considered an energy waster. <laughs> Well, it depends on your source of uh, heat. For example, uh, in Cranston, we're using waste heat off of the uh, water-cooled chiller. We're using condenser water to reheat our air. So that's where we get our reheat from. So we're getting our reheat free um, because we're using condenser water, which is heat rejected from the chiller. And that, that water, that uh, condenser water temperature is 95 degrees Fahrenheit. And you can see in this little example where we're reheating the air from roughly, I think it's roughly 50 degrees Fahrenheit up to 60. And so our approach temperature is 95 minus 60, which is 35 degrees. So the, there's plenty of capacity in the condenser water to reheat the air for free. So uh, in our case, that's what we would do. And, and a lot of uh, systems, they'll use uh, uh, the refrigerant waste heat um, off of the air-cooled uh, chiller. Um, or, or they'll interrupt the hot gas before it goes to the condenser and uh, put in a hot gas uh, reheat coil. So there's a variety of different ways to skin the cat without spending additional energy. Yep. Awesome job, Rich. Uh, I, I think this topic, uh, it, it's very difficult to um, to do this topic in just an hour. Uh, we, uh, what we spend four hours with our internal team uh, talking about this in two separate occasions, if I remember correctly. So, um, uh, yeah, it's a, it's a, it, you know, it, it's one of these things that, that falls in that category of practice, practice, practice. Right. And if you do enough of these uh, problems and you work with uh, folks that have some experience and you read some reference material, uh, eventually you'll get the hang of it. Uh, but it's an extremely important science because it's it's all about, uh, you know, the what air is all about. And you really can't do a system without doing a psychrometric analysis of the system. So this is just one little snapshot of what it's all about. Well, I, I think I'm after today, I think I can do sensible heat. <laughs> <laughs> Although uh, uh, our friend Ahmed said, uh, how can we calculate heating air for negative bulb temperature under freezing? So I'm not gonna get into that one. <laughs> Yeah, if somebody has a specific example, um, you know, uh, send us offline some information. Usually the simplest way to get a hold of us is send it through your local rep. And, you know, ask the question and uh, we'll be happy to answer it for you. Well, as usual, Rich, thank you. Great job. Um, uh, you want to say goodbye and then I'll sign off for everybody? Yeah, thanks everyone for participating in today's discussion. Uh, hopefully uh, you got some of the basic uh, language and, and a few of the processes. And uh, the more you work with it, the better you'll get. So turn it over to Brett. Thanks again, everyone. As usual, Rich, great job. Uh, you, you, you took a relatively complicated slash difficult to understand and and made it understandable to, to, to many of us. Uh, so I appreciate that. 
Happy Flag Day, everybody. Today's June 14th. That is the uh, 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 little known holiday, and, and not, not that we get time off or anything, but happy is that flag like day. Sheldon Cooper, fun with flags? Yeah. There you go. I remember that. That's right. He, he knew a lot about flags. Uh, but uh, anyways, a uh, lot, lot of thank yous. Uh, great job, Rich. A lot of, lot of, lot of pats on the back. So uh, we do appreciate everyone's time. I am going to be off tomorrow. I'm taking a vacation day, and I'm going deep sea fishing for the day. I'm uh, looking forward to it out of Gloucester, Mass. Uh, so wish me luck. Hopefully I uh, a snag yeah, a hopefully, big one. Hopefully you one. catch something. Yeah, I know. I want to. Maybe, maybe I'll have fish tomorrow night, uh, but more than likely I'll have to buy it. But you never know. <laughs> <laughs> so anyways, uh, th th there you go. Thanks, John. Th thanks, everybody. Uh, take care and uh, look for your emails tomorrow. And if you have any issues, let us know. In a couple of weeks, we will be talking about our um, uh, SKV pump and uh uh, that's a, a, a pretty neat topic, and uh, we'll be getting out our next quarter uh, topics uh, very shortly as well. So thanks, everybody. Great questions. And, and as we always say at the beginning, the more questions, the, the better the, 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 the uh, discussion is. So take care. Great job again, Rich. We will see you down the road. Bye, all.